Welcome, this is Building Virtual, Building Relationships in a Virtual World. So I think at this point we all know this is where we want to be. But we'll start off real quick with who am I? Um, so my name is Kaylin Wagner. Um, I manage our strategic customer success team at Pantheon. Um, I also work with our East Coast not strategic, so it's a little confusing right now. I have a lot of people under me. Basically what that means though is like we work with contract customers at Pantheon, helping them be successful on the platform, work with them long term, develop relationships, help with advising, become trusted advisors, answer technical questions, answer lots of money, um, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, just getting started, so go ahead, pop on in, no problem. Um, so, but I've been working remote customer success since 2014, so I have a couple of years experience on uh, working with people not in person, uh, customers and colleagues alike. Um, I've also basically, I, I'm calling it remotely led collaborative gaming teams on and off since 2005, which is my resume safe way of saying I've run guilds in World of Warcraft and raid teams, which if you think that doesn't have a element to that transitions, you would be slightly wrong because it is all remote based team building and activities. So um, it, I have a different talk that I sometimes give on how to transfer skills from MMOs to the job place because they're there. Um, other things about me, I'm a fiber artist, I quilt, I sew, I spin, I knit, I do all sorts of other things. Uh, I have two fluffy gremlins who supervise me on a daily basis. They have claimed parts of my desk so they can keep an eye on me and make sure that I'm keeping it honest uh, and located in Augusta, Georgia. So, why are we here? Basically, with this shift in COVID, everyone moving to working remotely, um, just general spread of talent pools, more jobs are working remote, you're working with customers more remote, um, you're working with your colleagues more remote, and I keep hearing things from like my colleagues, from customers, from people like, I don't understand how to read body language. If I don't see you in person, I don't understand how to connect with you. I can't build this relationship unless we're in the same place. You know, I think the one that kind of caught me most off guard was when somebody said, the best ideas come from in-person meetings. And I went, hey, I've worked remotely for this company for three years and I think I've had some good ideas. <laughs> and we were not in the same room when that happened. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of took the person aback for a second because they went, you're right. Because it's just a difference in mindset shift. That people, if you are used to working in an office, if you're used to being able to collaborate in a room with somebody, you have developed a skill set over the course of your career for in-person collaboration. If, like me, you only worked in an office for two years and the majority of your working career has been remote, you have developed a skill set of remote collaboration and ability to do those things. And so, you know, we kind of joked at the start of COVID and when the office closed, we were like, we're gonna do a presentation for the recently de-officed. <laughs> because you guys have no idea how to work from home now and we're gonna help you out with this because there's some stuff you're gonna need to get used to. Um, so, basically all these things that are being said, like people that just don't understand that they can work remotely, I just I don't accept that that's true. It's just a new skill set, it's just something you have to figure out. So how do we go about this? Kind of broken this up into three little sections. The first one is like getting to know you. We can pop into the Julia Roberts, whatever version of this you'd like to, but the thing that I have learned the most, and this is kind of like the crux for me, like this is, I could boil this entire talk down into this slide, because if you share with people, they tend to share back with you. And that is how you can start building a relationship. That doesn't mean that you need to know your social security number. <laughs> doesn't mean need that they need to know your medical history or anything like that. But you've got a cat that walks past you in the background or jumps over your webcam to get behind your monitor so everybody gets a lovely view of a cat belly in the middle of a meeting. You can acknowledge this, you can talk about it, you can share it, you can tell a funny story, and people will probably want to reciprocate. And that is the very basic building block of starting that relationship. Um, the thing about this though is, you know, not everybody wants to build a relationship with their coworkers. Like, 
I personally have a hard time understanding that because I'm a very friendly person. Some people are just like, I'm here to work. I don't want to get to know you. I don't care. Don't care about your family. Don't care about your other stuff. How can I help you at work? Let me go there. That's fine. I may personally make it a goal to slowly crack that nut over the course of years. I, you know, count it a victory <laughs> when I can pull out some piece of information that nobody else knows. Um, but it's okay. If somebody really doesn't want to, that's cool. But that said, if you can share stories, if you can share experiences, if you can do those things, people will warm up to you. It's like, you know, when you look at somebody and you smile, they almost can't help but smile back. It's the same thing just through a computer screen. So, so often as people are getting used to working from home, and even now, two years into this, you know, like I was doing an interview last week with somebody and their doorbell rang, their dog started barking. They were mortified because they were like, oh my God, this is so unprofessional. My dog is barking, you can't hear me, this is horrible. I'm so sorry, I was gonna lock him outside so this wouldn't happen. And I was like, tell me about your dog. Like, what kind is it? Is it like, does this normal? Does he like protect the house? Or are we just having a good day? And like, because that was a connection. Like, cool, you have a dog. Tell me about your dog. How long have you had him? How old is he? What color? What's his name? Like, let's go there. And you could see the person relaxing because suddenly this thing that they thought was going to be the end all for this interview of imperfectionality became like a five minute talking point where we just got to connect and have fun. So I try to encourage people to like the stories, the laughter, the wayward animals and children. <laughs> you know, I had a call with a former C-level person at my company and her husband happened to come out of the shower in a robe not realizing she was on a call. <laughs> Passed through the background real quick. She saw it, I saw it, we both had that moment and we just started laughing. She was like, I am so sorry. I was like, it happens. But it was a moment that built a block for us where we had this shared asinine experience of absurdity that just, you know, I like when we'd see her, she, you know, every once in a while she'd just be like, oh my God. And I'm like, I know. Because it just kept coming up. And that was a small in on that relationship. And as part of that, what I try to remind people is just because you're working from home and you're not in an office anymore, it doesn't mean you have to work 100% of the time. Like, people are so like, we must have efficiency, we must do the thing, we must have a call that is 100% business all the time. You know, you walk into a call and if people are chatting at the start, someone's getting annoyed because you're not taking part in the meeting. But if you think about it, when you were in an office, you would go get water or a drink and you would talk to somebody in the kitchen for five minutes. You would run into somebody in the hallway and you would catch up with them. Your coworker would turn around in the cube and tap you on the shoulder and be like, hey, can you help me with this? Or like, I just want a break for a minute, let's chat. That happened and it was fine. Now that we're all isolated and you're in your own space, it's like, I can't waste your time. Like we're gonna get in this call, we're gonna get what we need done, let's move on, let's not talk about something random. You feel bad taking that time because there's like a perception of like, if I'm working remotely and nobody can see that I'm working, how do I show everyone that I'm working? And that's by being super focused when I'm working with them. But then you're never taking that time to get to know your colleagues. You're never getting the time to get to know your customer because you are just business all the time. That doesn't work. Now, you do have to be careful. You know, you don't want to spend the entire hour meeting discussing not what you came here for, because that is a waste of time. But it's okay to have five to 10 minutes at the front of a call where you're like talking about something random. You know, two people join the call early, they start a small chit chat. More people start joining the call, they join in. Let it go for five or 10 minutes, see where it happens. And then be like, all right, cool. This was great, let's get on with the meeting. People are usually good with that. There have also though, I will completely admit, been times I work with people across the globe and they find out that I live a mile from a llama farm and they're like, you mean you have trees? I live in Barcelona. What is a tree? Everything is building. And we 
actually did legitimately pull up Google Maps. <laughs> Everyone took turns screen sharing because we had somebody from New York City near Central Park, me near Llama Farm, people in Barcelona, people outside of Barcelona, some folks in Italy. And people were like pulling up their home address and showing us their neighborhoods. Like, this is my work commute. This is what I see. Like, I'm five minutes from the beach. I'm five minutes from a llama farm. And like, we did not accomplish a single thing we set out to do in that meeting. But what we did do is we built a, fa a fantastic relationship and a friendship there. Because the next time I saw him, I was like, hey, when's the last time you went to the beach? Like, they letting you go to the beach yet? Like, are you allowed to go out of the house? And they're like, ah, uh, no, I mean, how are the llamas? You, you gotten any babies yet? Like, you just have this sideways tangential connection that isn't work-related, that makes them friendlier towards you, you friendlier towards them, there's empathy. And, you know, when we get on the next call and they need to yell at me because something went wrong with a site deployment, they like me a little bit more. <laughs> because they know I live near a llama farm, or you know, whatever this thing is. Um, and you can also see like the other suggestions on here. Like These are small things you can do. Um, there will be a couple pictures later, you'll be able to see what's in my backdrop. It's so, like ask about interest in the backdrop. This is a deliberate plan on my part. <laughs> I have an interesting office backdrop to start conversations with people, because it helps. Um, the big thing too though is like, remember the stuff that you talk about with folks and follow up on it. You know, bring it back. Show them that you weren't just paying lip service to listening or asking. Build on that, you know? If, you know, like I had a customer, she just gotten a new puppy. I met with her six months later, I'm like, how's the puppy? Are we still a puppy? How are we doing? Are things getting better? And she appreciated that I remembered because it wasn't just a one-time thing. And that's start how you kind of building that loyalty. I have coworkers that like, I may only talk to you once a month because we don't work together that much, but I know something going on in their lives. And it's like, hey, like, didn't you guys have, like, have a new baby like six months ago? How is, how's that going? Like, how, how much have they grown? Are we walking, are we running? What are we doing? And they see that you care. And so they care back. And it's actually pretty cool. And then, like, I, I do a lot of customer-focused relationship building, but I'm also managing a team. Today is the first day I've met some of my team members. I've never met them in person in two years. So how do you get that relationship with your colleagues? And that goes back to, like, it doesn't have to be 100% business all the time. I joke, like, the water cooler still exists in your mind. You can go there. You can take the time to do these things. You can set up a coffee break in the morning. If everyone's in the same time zone, people wanna have a cup of tea, people wanna have lunch at the same time, open up a Zoom chat, Zoom room for 30 minutes, people can drop in, drop out, say hi. It doesn't have to be work focused. You can say, hey, I have to do a ton of paperwork. I don't wanna do it, it's gonna be boring. Who wants to hop in a Zoom and listen to music? or just chit chat while we take care of some of this stuff. Can be some of the best conversations because you're getting stuff done, you're hanging with your people. Um, I frequently, there are people that I work with who like, I'll work with them really closely for a couple months because we have something that we're doing. I love them, I think they're great. And then I don't have a reason to work with them again. So I'll set up an every other month meeting, 30 minutes, it's just like, hi so that I can like take 30 minutes and say hi and talk to them. And people love that, but they're afraid to do it because I'm gonna put a 30 minute meeting on someone's calendar just to say hi. <sighs> Never have had a bad negative response to it. You know, if there's people that you care about, people you wanna build relationships with, that you work with, you make the time to do it, they will make the time to do it with you and you will have a stronger team overall especially cross-functional different departments if you're not working together regularly. Um, some of the other things I put in here, it's basically like, you can boil this down to be a good human being. If you have friends that like, you know your friend's sick and you would check on your friend a week later and say, hey, you feeling better? 
do that with your colleagues. Be considerate, be human, be kind. And people will be human, considerate, and kind back. It's really weird, but it does work that way. And I've said this so many times, but it's so important to say this, and you'll hear me say it again before we're done. It is okay to take the time to do this. Most of the time, we're not curing cancer. We're not sending rockets to space. Some of your companies might be that you work with, in which case, you know, choose your time things carefully. But it's okay if you get something done 10 minutes later because you took 10 minutes to check in on someone and be a human and build that relationship. Come on in. And this is just kind of something that like, if you read through this and you think about it, you look at this presentation later, I spelled this out. I try not to read my slides, but this one I will. Relationships build trust. If you stop and you think about the colleagues that you have the most trust with, the relationships that you work, the customers that you work best with, and you try to think about how that all overlaps with what kind of relationship you have with those people or that customer, and how much you have brought of yourself, your authentic self to that relationship, there's gonna be a strong overlap in almost every case. It's just true. And it's like, oh, that makes sense. This feels obvious, except it isn't. Because we're so trained that when you're at work, you're working. You're not, you're not being a, a person, you're being a worker. But if you bring that humanity back to work, you can go so much further. All right. So we're gonna change gears a little bit, going into body language, because that is something that I hear a lot. People are like, I can't read body language through Zoom. And I'm like, yes you can, you just don't know it. So we have game time. Uh, this is where I was saying there's gonna be screenshots, you can kind of see my background of my, my office a little bit here. But uh, this is, my coworkers didn't understand what I was doing when I was sitting on a really long call making funny faces and taking screenshots to put this slide together. So somewhere there's a Zoom recording of a very serious discussion taking place and me being like, <laughs> doing all these weird things so I could get this. It's actually pretty funny. But basically, if you take a minute and you're looking at these, like, what do you think is happening in some of these pictures? Like, if you have an idea, it's like, what, what's going on in one? What's going on in two? What's happening in seven? Like, anybody got any thoughts? Shout it out, don't be afraid. Seven. You look a little bit bored in number one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, bored in number one. Seven, somebody's walked in the room. <laughs> exactly. The cat fell off your desk. Cat fell yeah. off the desk. Um, three, there's a light from a phone there, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> arranged by the D&D character neutrality? It is not, but I should. I should do that. Basically though, like when you're looking at this, you're looking at these and you're going, yeah, I recognize those faces. That's distracted. That's something else is going on. Like trying to pay attention, trying to do, I may need to fix one because you call out a different emotion there, so I need to make that one better. But like, you can tell what people are doing when you're in a Zoom call with them if they're on camera. You do know. You have learned a lot <laughs> about what people are doing. You know how to read the body language. You just don't think you have. And like, I think everyone's so used to, like we were taught in school, like this is what active listening looks like. When you're in person, you know how to recognize that. When you're on a Zoom call, you only get half of the active listening. <laughs> So people are like, oh, I can't read it. But, but you can. Um, the other thing about it is this is a new skill for a lot of people, or a newer skill. Like, it feels like after two years, it's like, well, it shouldn't be a new skill anymore. But let's be real. For the first six months, we thought it wasn't going to be a long-term thing. After a year, we thought it wasn't going to be a long-term thing. At two years, we're still hoping it's not going to be a long-term thing. In two years, compared to the rest of your life, of learning how to interact with people in person isn't a lot of time. So these are new skills you are developing. It's okay to not be fully confident in it, but trust yourself a little bit more because you know more than you think you do. The other thing that you can do knowing that everyone else is also in the same boat of not necessarily knowing what's going on, help them out. 
turn your camera on. If all I'm doing is looking at a picture of you, I have no idea if you're engaged. I don't know if you're understanding, I don't know if you're mad, I don't know if you're paying attention, if you're on your phone, if you're writing email. I got nothing. Are you even in the room? Yeah, are you even there? Um, so there's a couple people that I have been on Zoom calls with have taken very convincing pictures of themselves doing this <laughs> that they use as their image for, for Zoom. So when their thing's off, it looks like they're there paying attention. And I'm like, short video. You sneaky, no. I did a short video of me just. Yeah, exactly. And it just looks. Yeah, and that's, it's not helpful when you're trying to build a relationship with people. So the other thing though is like, I don't want to say overact, but sometimes you have to overact a little bit when you're on a call. You know, you have to be expressive. You have to use a slightly exaggerated facial feature. You have to use your voice more effectively to extol a virtue or to make a point. Um, and then when you're the person that's listening, that's taking the feedback, you have to do more to show that you're paying attention if you're paying attention. I'm like, I'm not paying attention all the time. No one is. Whoever is editing this, we got cut off. Um, basically, there are small things that you can do to help signal to people that you are engaged. If you're sitting, you know, like sometimes if I'm on a call and it's like not like super formal, I'll sometimes like sit like this. So I'm like kind of have my chin resting in my hand while I'm listening because it shows my hands aren't on my keyboard. They can see that I put my focus on what they're saying. I can be looking at the webcam, and this is like always fun, like everyone's like, if you're looking at the screen, your webcam's here, you're looking here, it doesn't look like you're looking at people. It's like put googly eyes on your webcam, stare at the eyes, helps out. If you look at the webcam, it makes it look like you're looking at them. So they feel like you're paying attention. Um, and like, you just have to kind of be conscious, like read the room, again, this kind of all goes back to like, be a good human being. If you can show that you are active in a way from the chest up, because that's what most people's video cams are going to be showing, they can see that. And they're going to respect it, and they're going to respond to it. Because like, you have all, I promise, been on a call where you were talking and got nothing from the people around you. <laughs> and then they all say, you're muted. Yeah, well, well yeah, then they say you're muted, so you unmute yourself and you try again. Um, but like, it's awkward when you're presenting or you're trying to have a conversation, you're trying to get people engaged and everyone is just gone. So if you can be the person who is there, who is paying attention, who is showing that someone is there and paying attention, um, it's actually really impressive to see how much they can calm down. And because you are the person who is there and paying attention, they appreciate you, they'll do the same thing for you later, typically. And that's another step in that building relationships because you're being polite, you're being respectful, you're helping them, they're helping you. It's a good thing. Um, so, kind of moving into like the last section, more focused on teamwork, because like as a manager with, you know, we've hired a lot of new people over the last year, nobody's met in person. How do you build a team when you aren't meeting in person and everyone's used to meeting in person? So, it is harder, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not going to tell you that it's easy, but there are ways. Um, one of the things that we're fortunate um, at Pantheon that we're allowed to do is like they're really invested in the remote experience, so they let us work with a company called Escape Bay Routine, they're based out of San Francisco, but they do events nationwide where it's like, we're going to do a mixology workshop. You sign up, we're going to send you a kit with everything you need but the booze, We'll take an hour, we're gonna get on a call with a bartender, and we're gonna have a good time. Or a magic show, or designing a ukulele, or a pumpkin carving class, or like there's just tons of options. And it's a really good way for you as a company, you as a manager, you and just a team deciding you wanna do this with your people to show that it's okay to take the time to do something that isn't work related, to get to know people during work hours. And that's really part of like managers actively needing to provide space for their team to not work together. Um, like we, I had a new person join my team and she kind of reached out to me really tentatively. She's like, 
I was thinking about setting up like a water cooler hour once a week that people could drop into and out of, but like, I feel like I shouldn't do that because that's like an hour of not working. And I was like, do it, please. Somebody needs to own this. Yes, set it up, make it optional. People can come if they want. They won't come if they don't want to. Go, do. And she was like, oh, okay. You mean this is okay? I'm like, yeah, this is great. Please do this. And that's part of setting the example. If you want your people to have a team, you want your people to build relationships, you have to encourage it when they start trying. You have to give them the space to do it. And if you aren't a manager and you don't have that authority, you can go talk to your manager and try to explain this and be like, hey, we need to get some team building. Like, and it doesn't have to be a trust fall. <laughs> it can just be hanging out for a half hour in Zoom. Um, and if you're like a senior member of the team, you know, not a manager, but like you've been around for a while, the new people who join you are looking to you for cues on what's okay and how to act. So if you want to have a collaborative environment with people that have relationships, that tell stories, that talk about their cats, that talk about their dogs, that share pictures of their father-in-law's fire pit because he spent two months pulling giant boulders out of a hole in his backyard and it's insane, you have to share the picture of the insane fire pit that your father-in-law built and tell them the story. And then they start sharing those stories with you because it's okay. And when by doing that, you are building trust. You are building cohesion, you are building a team, and you are building a group of people that is gonna do so much more. And if you're working with your customers, if you have clients, when you have to go take them the hard news that something went wrong, something's gonna be over budget, something didn't work right, we need to rethink this, it's gonna be more expensive, it's gonna, you know, all these things, you have something else to fall back on because you have that relationship. They know you, they understand you, they know you're not trying to screw them over, you're trying, you know, it's, you know, it, I don't want to say it's like a manipulative tool because that's really like crass, but like you have a tool of past history of doing good with them that isn't work related. So when you come to them and you're like, I have this problem, <laughs> they're going to be a little bit more empathetic and it's going to be a little bit easier of a conversation. You know, they're going to give you a little bit of leeway, usually, not always, um, but it makes it easier. And then it's easier to recover and rebuild the trust again later because you've already done it once. They know you, they know things, it's, it's good. Um, so that is, I believe, all that I have prepared. Um, so that's the end of the presentation, but if anybody has any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to speak up or if people wanna go wander for a while, you can. I'll freely admit I'm one of those people that like to keep my camera off because I don't like the idea of someone like scrutinizing whether I'm listening or not, right? Yeah. And I understand that I need to have it on whenever I'm speaking, but I will keep it off if I'm listening. And this has persuaded me that I should keep it on to show that I'm listening. Awesome. Even during those small meetings, but I think there's a certain level of meeting, like Absolutely. person, uh, you know, when you've got 300 people on a Zoom call, they're not looking at your one window. So in that situation, <laughs> is it better to leave your camera on to still show that you're listening and reacting? Or in that situation, would it be better etiquette to turn it off and be less distracted? You know, that is that's a really good question. I'm going to repeat it just so the recording can pick it up. It was basically like in a large call where there's 100, 200 people, is it better etiquette to have your camera off or to leave it on? And my answer to that is it's basically a judgment call on the type of meeting and the type of people and how involved you are in the content. So like for example, um, our company does every week a weekly orientation kickoff. Um, the entire company comes, news is shared, we do a deep dive on a topic. If the, do the deep dive topic is being presented by somebody in my department, my team, like my people, I will 100% have my camera on to be supportive of them because Zoom also filters people with cameras onto the top so they can see a friendly face and they know that someone is paying attention. If it's 
random Joe Schmo, I know nothing about this, it's not my problem, I'm like interested, but I'm also checking email. Yeah, I'll probably keep my camera off. Um, and if, if like, like with weekly kickoff, when we get new hires, we introduce them during that as well. I'm gonna be speaking, so I leave my camera on the whole time, because that way I'm not going in and out. But like, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's difficult to say here's a hard and fast rule on that, because if it's an all hands company presentation and they're not expecting, they're not expecting people to interact with them, it's fine to leave your camera off. Um, if, if you want to show support for the topic, for the person on a personal level, it's a good thing to leave the camera on so that you can be that smiling face. But yeah, no hard and fast rule. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, first, I apologize for coming in late. No problem. It was either we used both Team and Zoom. Yeah. One of those, I think it may be Zoom, that had a together mode. I don't know if anybody's seen that. I haven't. But if you have a large, and I don't know what the parameters are. We just showed up one day. I pulled the menu down. It said together mode, and we had about 15 people, and I clicked it, and it changed it for the entire oh, session. Right. And you're, it shows you everybody like sitting in an auditorium. And oh. Each little person, so on the screen, you can see each little person sitting at a desk. Interesting. It was, it was way cool. I'll have every, to look for that. The meeting went downhill because everybody started. Well, yeah, because everyone's then going, let's play with it and enjoy. Yeah. But that's interesting. Together mode. I'll have to see yeah, what that's teams are doing. I can't figure out where. Like, yeah. Sometimes it's on, sometimes yeah. it's off. Yeah, so I don't know if it has to be a certain number of people for it yeah. to show up. Or I'll have to look into that because yeah. that, that sounds entertaining. You can have the same as that experience. Yeah. Like, this is so cool. Now that I. We forgot what we were reading about. <laughs> we will get no more work accomplished. And that is perfect. Because it is a shared experience of absurdity that everybody can harken back to. That's I, I, I like, there was a, I can't remember who did it. Somebody did a TED Talk years ago on like the experience of shared absurdity. The creating experiences of shared absurdity. Great TED Talk, worth watching. Um, but like, I love that because like, the weird things that happen are what you remember and what make you giggle later. If you can see the absurdity in it and have fun with it. Do you remember, uh, well, I'm sure you, last year's Drupal camp was on Gathertown? Yeah. Well, I, at that time, I set up a, it was a free account, you know, with limited number of users, but we we're trying to think of team building for our team. And I was going to suggest let's build, since we're no longer in our office suite, let's build our office suite. Because we used to do ping pong in the conference yeah. room and movies and Nintendo. Let's build a virtual suite of offices. Everybody can join. And you can run around, talk to each other, play a game. Yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, if you have a team that would use something like that yeah. and get involved in it, that's great. My, my one coworker and I, on Thursday, after work, uh, we have a happy hour. Yeah. So just we both drink wine and talk about the yep. group. I, uh, yep, I have I have done that with some of my colleagues, having a happy hour. I actually have a customer who, if fortunately she's not my customer anymore, so it's more okay now, but like we became good friends and we would get together once every couple months and have a non-work related, <laughs> yeah, not <work> <laughs> you know, yeah, happy hour and just chat and catch up. She's the one that had the puppy, um, but she's great. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to be able to do those things. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody? I mean, feel free. If not, that's fine. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stop the big red button, but uh, basically, I don't 